Hello, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 24. Today we're going to talk about fixing Nebraska's coronavirus data so we can know about safely and getting kids back to school. Uh, so how's Nebraska doing? Well, Nebraska, I'd say we're not getting worse, but we're not getting all that much better. We're sort of smoldering right now. Uh, we've hit 183 deaths, which was more than those initial projections, uh, which doesn't surprise me too much. I suspect we'll be at probably four to 500 maybe by the end of June, although the people who are getting affected aren't, aren't as likely to die. So, so that may help a little bit, which we'll talk about uh, later on. Uh, so Lincoln demographics, uh, essentially the people, at least in Lincoln anyway, it's mostly people who worked at the Smithfield uh, uh, plant and their relatives and family members is, is our biggest chunk of spread. Uh, those people are relatively younger, so less likely to die. And I think that's uh, true across the state because our meat processing facilities were our main outbreaks. The people who got infected were less likely to die. So our fatality rate hasn't as bad, been quite as bad as we might fear, but it's unfortunately still worse than it could have been. Uh, if we look at Nebraska state data, they are starting to release some state data now. Uh, they break it down by both ethnicity and race. So ethnicity is a cultural background, if you don't know, whereas race is actual genetics. So Hispanic, for example, is a culture, not a race. Uh, but African American, Native American, or Spanish would be a race. Uh, and so, uh, so right, what you see here basically is that you know, the, the outbreaks reflect uh, basically, for most part, the demographics of our meat processing facilities. And so that's been the hardest hit area in Nebraska is our, is our low income immigrant ethnic populations. It's also why they've had the most hospitalizations. Uh, because they're a little younger and healthier, though, they aren't as many as the deaths because the deaths are probably more in the older nursing home, which are more of the people who've been here five, six generations, German, Swedish descent. Still a lot of deaths, though, and still disproportionate, though, in the Hispanic community. And so who gets infected does to kind of determine who's most likely to die. Uh, and so it is good that we're starting to track this and look at this information. Uh, the other thing though is data by itself isn't helpful unless you put it in context. And so one way to put it into context is to look at us compared to the rest of the state or the rest, or rest of the country or the rest of the world. And so this is a way to look at us, you know, how many people were getting infected at any one time. New York, obviously, as most people know, had the worst outbreak and then New Jersey as well. Uh, where's Nebraska compared to us? Well, New York and New Jersey are actually dropping down to lower than Nebraska. And that's why I say Nebraska is just kind of smoldering. We're not getting that much better. We're not getting that much worse. We're kind of smoldering. Uh, but it depends on where you live in Nebraska. So you have a tale of multiple cities. And so if you look, we had a lot of our, our big peak was basically all these meat processing facilities. Those have actually done a pretty good job of getting their, their, their uh, epidemics contained. Unfortunately, the smoldering is happening from Dodge, Sarpy, and Douglas County. Uh, and these are some bigger population bases. So this could actually be a big problem if this spreads and gets worse. So another way to look at this is how do we look at the county level versus New York City? Well, New York City at its worst was getting you know, 50 to 60 per 100,000. Uh, we actually had more intense outbreaks in Lexington, Crete, and Grand Island. Uh, and so these were actually potentially even worse. Now, the good news is they're getting their, their rates all the way back down to just like New York City has. Uh, hopefully Saline and uh, Crete will get there as well. Uh, Lanc Lincoln Lancaster County has pretty much stayed okay. And luckily the, the spread from Smithfield wasn't that bad in to, from Crete. Uh, but I'm worried about Douglas County here, which is up to here and Dodge County, which actually may be start be sort of our next outbreak town. Uh, and then we'll hopefully the, the, the protests don't make all this worse and result in another spike in those communities because they could be heading to a New York City experience. And if Douglas County does that, that's enough to overwhelm our hospitals. So we have to watch that very closely going forward. Um, another problem we have is just the quality of our data. So an example I would use here in Lincoln is that we had this spike on May 18th of 91 cases. That didn't, those are not cases that happened on May 18th. Those are cases that happened back here. The physicians were, draw, were seeing these patients, diagnosing them, drawing the test, but it, we had a big backlog in tests, so they didn't come in until that Monday. But the physicians actually knew about it back here, and of course the infections were even farther back here. We have that happening again. I've talked to a lot of physicians here in Lincoln. We're back to three to seven day turnaround from one of our biggest labs, so we could have another spike. We won't know for a while yet. Hopefully that percent positive is low, but there's this potential another spike, which is why some people are moving to a seven day or even a 14 day moving average because of this, this erraticness of our data, which is really limiting our response. Uh, we need to start looking at our data a little different, unfortunately, and hopefully start correcting how the data is being tabulated. So how is it happening in other communities? Well, again, here's uh, pictures of Dawson and Hall counties and Saline County having our big outbreaks, but think, thankfully getting those under control. But Douglas, Sarpy, and Dodge County starting to head up. These are not population adjusted, though, so they're not necessarily comparable like that other graph I just showed you. So data problems and how we could use data better. I think the biggest problem going forward is we need to get our data fixed and we need to get a better turnaround in our testing. Those are the two biggest things we could fix to get our communities open safely and get our kids back to school in August. 
Uh, one uh, model I really like is the one pushed out by Tom Frieden. Uh, all the other guidelines put out by Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Inter American Enterprise Institute, as far as I can tell, everybody just threw them out because they thought they were going to be too hard to do. Uh, this model actually I think is a very common sense intuitive model and I hope we'll move toward that. But one of the things is the risk alert level, which is very intuitive and for, easy for people to understand. And, and get a good idea, understanding of, of what that means, assuming that the, the needle is set correctly. And that's a little, with bad data, you, you got to be a little worried is the needle being set correctly right now if our data is old and slow. So hopefully we can fix those data issues. The concepts that he puts in as a system, which again, I think all th six of these will really help us get where we need to go. Is, is your system easy to understand? And I think that uh, speedometer stoplight motif is easy for people to understand. It's potentially very adapted to where you live because it's like the weather report in your city, not necessarily statewide. It's very practical. You know, if it's green, I don't need to wear a mask, but if it's yellow, orange, or red, I do need to draft. It could be data driven if we fixed our data. Uh, and then transparency, well, I hope it's going to be transparent. How are we going to set that needle and is it being set correctly? So transparency, we need to work a little on transparency and cleaning up our data. The last thing is collaborative. That's the biggest problem that I think is missing in Nebraska is a lack of, lack of collaboration and communication on how all this is getting done and, or not getting done. Uh, so one of the key concepts in, in pandemic response is this by Larry Brilliant. Uh, this is a great TED talk and I've got a link at the, on the YouTube comment section if you want to watch it and I would highly recommend you write, watch it if you haven't. Uh, Larry Brilliant, and yes his name really is Brilliant, uh, he was part of the worldwide effort to uh, rid the world of smallpox which is very very effective of course. Uh, and so but one of the key th uh, concepts of pandemic response is early identification and early response. Well, to have early identification, you got to listen to the people on the ground, the doctors and urgent care centers and nurses who are actually seeing the cases, which has not happened in Nebraska, and you need a rapid turnaround your test. You can't have tests taking three to seven days to get back because then you're not going to have any positives showing up in the public health data. So early identification, to do that, we need to get the doctors involved, the nurses and clinics, and we also need to have better turnaround time for our tests. So here in the, again, like Lincoln, essentially, basically, you know, this spike didn't happen there. All these people were being seen by physician offices who knew this was coming back here. We knew they were there, but we didn't have tests back and people were actually infected back here. So we need a faster turnaround time and not waiting for so long for our tests to get back. In every community uh, that we had an outbreak, physicians were aware of it before the state was aware of it. So here in Grand Island Hall County, the physicians knew about it here. They actually had to write an op-ed in the Omaha World Herald to get people to pay attention to it because they couldn't get any help from the state uh, until they actually wrote an op-ed in the World Herald that got carried by Fox News. Similar thing happened in Dawson County. One of the physicians in Lexington, they started seeing this. They actually called other physicians that crowned the state, including myself and Joe Miller in Omaha. We started calling the people we knew at UNMC and that state. Uh, so the physicians and community knew about it before the state knew about it. Same thing happened in Saline County. Josue Gutierrez is a family doctor down in, in Saline. He and I started contacting officials before the state rec recognized it. Uh, no one seemed to be listening to us for one to two weeks. If we want to prevent uh, similar outbreaks, we need a better communication pathway between physician networks and what, much better and more rapid testing. Uh, to be uh, to have an adaptive response, as Tom Frieden has said, and, and to make the second and third wave smaller, we're going to have to have a real quick way to respond. And if we can respond quickly, the length of that shutdown would be much lower. And so instead of having to shut down for eight or 12 weeks like now, we could shut down for two to four weeks potentially, which would be a much smaller impact on our economy. So uh, will schools start in August? Well, you know, this is a part of the problem we need to work through. So uh, I'm at the, on the school board here in Lincoln and we'll be working through this. It's a tough concept because 99.9% you know, .9 of the kids are going to be fine. They're the, luckily, the fatality rate for kids is very, very low. But school buildings were closed to protect the health of the community. Uh, but uh, so we still have to keep that in mind that we do need to get kids back in schools. I'm very, very worried about our Title I kids getting lost and, and falling farther behind. But we have to have a plan to protect the kids with health problems, their family members, the 10% of school staff with chronic conditions, and also keeping in mind the schools is a vector of spread in the community. To do this safely, we'll need to have a way to rapidly test people. And we'll test Nebraska work with the schools. We've not heard anything yet. I sure hope they will. Uh, so the big ask again, we want them to work with us so we can prevent some of these outbreaks. Uh, the next thing to, that also would be helpful is antibody testing to say, are any of these communities at health at herd immunity? Uh, New York City, I have had seen, seen some antibody testing results of 12 to 25 percent, depending on borough, were infected. There are a third to a half away potentially to herd immunity. Some of these communities actually may be there, so maybe we should do some random sampling of the Lexington, Crete, and Grand Island communities to see how far away they are uh, within that school age population. Maybe they are close to herd immunity, which they could start school much more more safely than the rest of us, but that's the kind of testing that needs to be done and some other things to investigate where we really are with our outbreak here in Nebraska. 
So my big ask is test turnaround time needs to be less than 24 hours, not three to seven days. So that should be our big metric going forward. And let's turn test turnaround, not just for Test Nebraska, but for LabCorp and Physicians Lab, CHI. All those labs need to be coming in a timely basis so that we can get on top of our epidemics quickly. Opening safely depends on that. So Test Nebraska needs to start working with physician networks and hopefully they'll fill our backlog. And so they need to start working with us right now. There is no way for us to directly order anything through Test Nebraska or even to know that, to redirect them to come to our community when we have a backlog. So we do need a way for Test Nebraska to help us so we can catch these outbreaks early. That's my single biggest ask today. Um, uh, again, we need to, you know, back to masking again. This is pretty much conclusive. I hopefully don't have to argue this anymore. There's a new study every week saying that masking does definitely works. Uh, this is because, and it's important because 20 to 35 percent of people have no symptoms, and those who are who are who do develop symptoms have been contagious for two to three days before they develop symptoms. That's why you need to be wearing your mask when you're out and about in the community, potentially expending others because you may not be maybe infected and not know about. It. Uh, the evidence is there, so I won't go through this again. Uh, again, reading these articles, I've put links to both the Aaron Bromage article and this one from NPR where they talked about the concepts of how to stay safe within an epidemic. Uh, and then our mass friend friendly business page has really taken off. So if you're a business, you want us to highlight you so that people who are at risk can go to your business and not be afraid of con contacting coronavirus because everybody's wearing a mask. Let us know. We'll definitely, we would love to highlight you because I think this is something that is very helpful and concrete for people at high risk who want to get out and about and buy their groceries and everything else. Last thing I'll lead with is a quote on leadership. So my favorite quote on leadership is by General Colin Powell and about caring and, and solving problems. And that leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers start stop bringing their problems is, is the day you stop leading them. They've either lost confidence that you can help or concluded you do not care. Either case is a failure of leadership. I think that's one of the reasons we're having all the protests around the country right now. There's a, a huge portion of the population that thinks that their leaders don't care and that nothing is being done for them. And I can understand that, uh, that frustration. Uh, in some ways, the physicians are frustrated too. Nobody seems to listen to us either uh, in the midst of a pandemic and it's very frustrating uh, but at least I don't I'm not that don't have the same obstacles that they're in front of and I don't have to worry about somebody shooting me or killing me uh, and so leadership is about caring so we need leaders to start sh demonstrating their care so we can tamp this down because this is the worst time and worst time to have an outbreak of a prostating like this in the middle of a pandemic so it's important that we get some control of this and I, I do have some hope I think things are going better in Lincoln uh, fingers crossed uh, next uh, uh, episode, we'll talk about we'll talk the, some of the after effects of coronavirus. Unfortunately, there's some negative health consequences, and one of them being a, a drop in vaccination rates in children, for example. So the lack of care that kids are getting, we need to get them back to the clinics. It is safe to get your kid back to a clinic and catch them up. We'll talk a little bit about the after effects in the healthcare system because we need a good healthcare system in Nebraska to get in control of this in the next year. Uh, so hopefully these are all helpful to you. Uh, these are my day jobs, uh, not necessarily the opinion of the people I work with, but this is where I work and these are who the people I am, I work with. So hopefully this is uh, helpful to you and uh, if you want to see past videos information, it's on the healthylincoln.org website. Thanks.